Welcome to My Wine Day, a celebration of Moldova's National Wine Day, presented to you virtually during this unprecedented global webinar and masterclass. We are just about to begin, but before we do, a few quick housekeeping notes. As attendees, you will all be muted for the duration of the webinar. However, you will see on your screen that there are two channels for you to communicate with other attendees and pose questions to the panelists. First is a chat section. So the chat section is an informal way for you to communicate with other guests. Just be sure to select everyone, all panelists and attendees in the to field as it can default to panelists only. Second, the Q&A section. This is where we ask you to please submit any questions you may have for the panel to be answered during the webinar. If you find yourself with streaming issues, you may want to encourage other members of your household to log off the internet and avoid simultaneous streaming to save bandwidth. And you may also want to log out and try again with another yeah. internet server, such as Firefox or Chrome. This webinar is being recorded and all of you will receive a link to the video recording in the following days. And the event is also currently streaming live on the Wine of Moldova Facebook and YouTube channels as well as the My Wine Day landing page. We have a fantastic lineup of speakers today. And before we bring on the esteemed panel that um, we see here, uh, we are very pleased to introduce our moderator for today, London-based wine writer, lecturer, and judge, Jamie Good. And from Moldova, Irina Bistrici, deputy director of the National Office of Wine and Vine of the Wine of Moldova, and chef and sommelier, Mihail Druta. The three will Hello. give a brief welcome to get the conversation started. So Rina, Mihail, and Jamie, we turn the screen over to you. Hello, everybody. Hello, friends of Wine of Moldova. We are um, happy to welcome more than 100 participants of this webinar who have already registered and thousands of people who are watching us from so many different countries. Already for 19 years, Wine of Moldova holds a fantastic event. Uh, this is the National Wine Day, which is the brilliant occasion of celebrating the millennial traditions of culture, of winemaking in our country. This year, the 19th edition, because of pandemic situation, we cannot celebrate it on the normal way in the central square of the capital of Kishina, but we have transformed it in online event and we call it My Moldovan Wine Day. Did you know that Moldova has the highest density of vineyards in the world and also the largest sellers in the world? Perhaps for many people Moldova is even hard to find on a map, but still we export more than 90% of all we produce, all wines that we produce. And why? Because it has a very good quality and fabulous indigenous grape varieties. Today, around Jamie Good, journalist and TV man from UK, and with nine panelists from nine different countries, nine wine experts, we will try four excellent Moldovan wines and we will try to discover Moldova. And also we will share our wine day, our national wine day with the whole world. So let's try Moldovan wines and say Norok. Norok. Um, can I tell you also some words? Today, it's a very important day for all the winemakers from Republic of Moldova. A lot of wine events has been canceled due to a specific uh, situation in the world. And uh, it's a chance for them, for the spe specialists from uh, wine area to promote Moldavian wines and to promote the work of wine producers. I hope that everybody who are watching us and uh, listening us to know better the wine of Moldova and to discover some specific and interesting facts. 
I hope that today we will speak and we'll have some interesting questions about our wine team, great wine team. So my job today is to, to moderate this panel. And it's got a, I've got a really great set of people from around the, the wine globe. Um, but first of all, just a very brief introduction to, to Moldova, which I mean, is a journey of exploration for me as well. Um, it's a wine region that uh, many of us are discovering. Um, and as Irina said, the, um, the, the amazing fact is that of all the countries that have vineyards, uh, Moldova has the highest proportion of land giving over to vineyards um, in the world. And there are 112,000 hectares planted at the moment, um, which to use a, a comparison, that's, that's about 14, 15,000 hectares more than South Africa, which is considered to be a major wine producing country. 50 different grape varieties grown. Um, the split is roughly 70% red, 30% white. 70% um, of, um, of the grapes grown are international varieties, and that's a legacy of, of you know, the time when a lot of the vineyards were being expanded. But a lot of the interest now is in the, the native, local, and regional varieties that have got a, a long history there that I think people from outside the country find quite interesting. And there's a lot of history of wine in Moldova. Um, there was kind of a bit of a bottleneck with the Soviet era. Um, lots of big factory wineries, wineries sprung up to supply um, wines to Russia. But since 2005, Moldova's focus has been um, away from the Russian market and the particular wines that, that were preferred by the Russian markets. The style has changed and it's become a very export focused industry. And 95% of all the the wines that are produced in Moldova leave the country, 40% of them go to the EU. And I think it's a, a country that's got a lot of potential and that's what we're gonna explore and discover in this webinar. Um, we've got four wines to try, so we'll intersperse a discussion about Moldova with the um, tasting of the wines. And, and they're, they're interesting wines, I've been through them all already. And this is, this is you know, a really interesting journey of exploration for me, and I hope it is for you as well. So I'm going to introduce the panelists in alphabetical order. Um, first of all, Andre Devold. And if Andre, you can switch your camera on. Um, so Andre is a, a wine specialist and author from Denmark. Um, then we have um, Chung Tao Se, who's a wine and gastronomy journalist, um, who's based, um, he covers Taiwan and China. Um, so yeah, another part of the world. Then we have um, Frank, Frank um, Smulders, who's a master of wine consultant and educator based in the Netherlands. Hello, Frank. And Jacques Oran, MS, who is a lecturer and author based in Quebec in Canada. So it's going to start getting cold there soon, I guess. Um, um, next, we have Julia Scarvo, who is a sommelier um, based in France. Yeah, no, no. Then we have um, Marc Van Helmont, who is a wine and gastronomy journalist based in Belgium and France. Hello, Marc. Hello. And then we head to the United States of America for Michelle Williams, who is a wine, food and travel writer. It's always good when people turn up on, on the screen, it's good, isn't it? Um, and um, last but not least, by any means, we have Robert Joseph, who is a very well-known wine consultant, um, um, recovering wine journalist and winemaker based in the UK. Maybe Robert's gone out for a cup of tea or something. Oh, he's there. Excellent. Excellent. Good. So uh, that's everyone, I think. That's the whole, the whole crew. Katie, could you show the map to give some context? So this is, um, not everybody is aware of where Moldova is. Um, and if you look at the map there, it's really well situated for viticulture. It's a prime spot um, based in, it's in Southeastern Europe and it's sandwiched between Romania and Ukraine in the Black Sea Basin. So... Um, the latitude is roughly 46 to 48 degrees. And if we could zoom in a little bit. So that's the three main wine regions marked there on the map. And you can see that the presence of the Black Sea there is kind of helpful because that's a moderating factor because winters can get kind of cold in a continental area like this. And, um, but between 46 and 48 degrees is just perfect for viticulture. It's a prime spot. Many of the world's famous wine regions are on the same sort of latitude. And also it's got good soils. The soils are very suitable for viticulture. Um, so it's one reason why we have so many um, 
vineyards here. It's just it's a good place to grow wine grapes. So um, let's um, get on with our discussion. And the first question I've got is, is um, for Robert. You've spent quite a bit of time in Moldova. I believe you, you've been going there for a number of years. So, um, you know, what um, is your impression of the wine scene now, and its, its position and evolution, and potential future directions? I'll be very brief, we've got a lot of people. But basically, I first went to Moldova in 1988, when it was still under the Soviet regime, and I've seen a complete blossoming uh, since then, and especially over the last 10 or 15 years. And I think that the, that what's been the impact of a young generation, and we're going to see one of the wines here uh, in our tasting reflects that. We've got a whole group of young winemakers who are coming up. We've got some big wineries um, that we've actually got, for example, Porcari and Bartelli, who are doing a lot of good work. But I think that the thing that I'm very fascinated in has been the work that has been done in Moldova, and to me what sets Moldova apart is not its indigenous grapes and not its international grapes, but the combination of the two. I think the Moldovans are some of the best blenders in the world of grapes from their own history and international grapes. And given what they've got in their vineyards, uh, and you'll see that in some of the wines we're tasting today, um, I think that there is huge potential for them to create unique complex wines that no one else in the world can do because of what they've got. The climate, by the way, is also one of the great climates in the world to make wines. They're a very, very easy place to grow grapes. Right, that's really cool. Um, I'm sure we'll come back to this then, you know, talking about the future directions again um, a little later. But um, um, Andre, I'll, I'll hand this one over to you. I mean, what's your experience been like of Mold Moldovan wine? And, you know, what, how would you like to see the wine scene develop there? Well, uh, my experience is uh, a lot more recent uh, because uh, I only went to, to Moldova last year in August, I believe, uh, for a week. And uh, before that, uh, I have to admit, I hadn't tasted one single bottle of Moldovan uh, wine. Uh, so at least I, I knew that they made wine in Moldova, but I, I, I have to admit, I had to look at the map to situate the, the country. And uh, speaking of this uh, situation of the country, we, we did, of course, we, we, we visited uh, a lot of producers. We did some nice tastings. And uh, one of the more inter interesting tastings was uh, where, the, where the wines were divided into regions. And I'm sure we're going to talk about these uh, regional characteristics. Uh, and it's very interesting. But for now, I think that Moldova has to focus on really the country as the brand wine of Moldova instead of the, the, the specific regions or the specific PTIs. And um, Frank, would you agree with that? Do you think that, you know, in terms of Moldova, the first thing is to actually um, get people familiar with um, Moldova itself? Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, I've been to the country once and um, I, after that, I also did some, some tastings for wines of Moldova and um, um, I mean, the, 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 the quality was each time uh, quite impressive. Um, but it is indeed uh, quite unknown territory, except for a few um, outside markets. I mean, Romania, of course, there's a, uh, a good link with the neighbor country. And, um, and there is a market in Russia, as difficult as it is sometimes. But, um, but uh, if you look at, at Europe, then uh, Moldova, people know that people know there's wine coming from Moldova. But um, no, most people wouldn't know where the country has been heading for um, in recent years. So they wouldn't know um, the, the great steps that uh, have been made um, forward. And um, uh, I think indeed um, the first step should be that people um, get to realize that, um, that uh, there's such tremendous quality coming from the country. And indeed, um, after that, um, the next step would indeed be to, to, to promote the different regions because there is regional difference. So that's absolutely true. Jacques, um, I'll hand this one over to you. I mean, do you think that um, the emphasis should be on the indigenous varieties? I know that people are talking, you know, they're saying, well, if you're going to the export market, have a point of difference and indigenous varieties represent a point of difference. Um, do you think that um, 
that's the direction to go, focusing on indigenous varieties? Or do you think, um, as Robert was suggesting earlier on, blends could be the answer? And you need to unmute. Okay, exactly, it's okay now. Yes, first I would like to, to share the, my opinion, you know, uh, it was my first time too when I went to Moldova last year in October, one year, exa one year ago exactly, and um, as my colleague, uh, we have visited a lot of uh, wineries and in, during this trip I had the chance to taste uh, many, many wines from, uh, from Moldova and uh, I've been impressed, really impressed by, with this vineyard, this beautiful vineyard with good peoples and one thing we have to say, I think, that uh, as in the, in the vineyards, as in the, in the cellars, they got good e equipments to, to work in really good conditions really good conditions now. And I'm sure the big difference between 20 years ago, 25 years ago and now. And to your question, I agree totally with uh, uh, our friend uh, from, from London, with uh, uh, Robert, because I share, uh, after all those testings, I think uh, with me here too, we had the chance to, to, to taste together many wines during a great evening together. And uh, really, really, I think, uh, and we're going to talk about uh, testing a uh, little, little bit later. Uh, the blend with uh, uh, local varieties and international, it gives really, really good results, I think, and good finesse in the wines, too, with, with the personality of the local varieties. Okay. Um, I, Julia, can I ask, can I hand this one over to you as well? I'd love to know, because you've spent a bit of time in Moldova, you know it quite well. Um, you know, what, what's your view on this whole sort of variety um, discussion? Um, yes, well, actually, I, I just went once to Moldova, but being Romanian, I had a, quite a good contact with Moldovan wines because we, we are a good market for Moldovan wines. And um, uh, I strongly believe, as in any case for any country, that if local varieties exist, they should be a focus. And I think this is the case for um, for Moldova, with whom we share uh, local varieties, actually. Uh, these local varieties are common to the whole Romanian-speaking space. And I first came into contact with this varieties in Romania, then in Moldova, and I uh, saw the differences between um, the, two, um, uh, the, the two expressions of these varieties on both sides of the fruit of the river that makes our frontier, and I think um, the, the clonal adaptation of certain so-called local varieties, it's very interesting to the Moldovan area. Let's take, for instance, the Raranagra, which really is pushed to pinnacle in Moldova and we are more clumsy with it in Romania where we call it Babasca Nagra but it's a really success in Moldova because they really choose the good clones um, if they make red, if they make rosé, if they use it for blend and it's the same for the Fetasca Alba which is uh, fewly represented today in Moldova but it starts getting up I mean, compared to Romania, where we have basically 12,000 hectares and they have like three, 400 hectares. But the quality of the Fetasca Alba I tasted in Moldova are uh, really interesting because it gets more freshness, more finesse, and um, it's more used as a single varietal than in, brand, in blends as we make it in Romania. Um, Fetasca Regala is also interesting because as a, a quite phenolic grape um, can have a very interesting uh, adaptation for gastronomy, whites, whites with uh, potential for aging and can also be a compound in blends as well. And um, yeah, I noticed these differences for these common local varieties of what I would call Romanian speaking space and of course local becoming local nowadays since 2000 they are reconquering Moldova and I think they have a big potential and Moldovans should focus on them um, in, uh, in monovarietals but also as they do it really really well in blends because as Robert mentioned they are very good blenders and this is a, a, a very interesting feature because we find these local varieties blended with international or Caucasian varieties and really congratulations for that. Okay, well, I think it's about time that we started 
to look at some of the wines and starting with the first wine, um, which will appear on the screen fairly soon. Um, and Michael, could you tell us a little yes. bit about this first wine that we're tasting, which is the... Um, so to, today we're going to taste Harapal. It's an uh, interesting wine because it's uh, two red grapes, but the wine making, it's a white wine, white wine making. It's a small producer. Harapalb, it's a fairy tale from uh, Moldavian, uh, let's say, uh, old, uh, old folklore. And uh, it uh, have a very specific uh, thing. Uh, it's a small producer, like I, I tell you, so uh, when we are speaking about wines from Moldova, it's not just big producer. We have a very perfect example of a small one. And uh, it's a Cabernet Sauvignon and Fetiasca Niagre. So two red grapes. Uh, let's put them a little bit in for me in the glass. Very nice aromas for me. It's very fresh, very light. The producer is small, it's calling Dan Prisacaro. And it's make, um, it, it was, um, uh, the idea was he have uh, some uh, little and small children, children and he are telling the, the fairy tales and appear the idea to make uh, such kind of wine, which is a little bit different from the classic one and to use red grapes and to make a white light wine. Colleagues, any opinion? Tell us. Yeah, Chung, Chung Ta, what do you think of this wine? What's your impression? Um, I, I honestly, I'm quite impressed by the quality of this wine because I have no idea about uh, Moldova wine before. I've never been there. I never been in this country. I don't have no idea about your culture, and uh, but uh, I like it's the full body. I think for uh, people come from Asia, I think this kind of wine will be very nice with our Asian street food. I think it, it can combine with uh, uh, so many uh, street food, Asian street food, with uh, even with the spicy. I, I think it will be very nice and. Um, uh, when the weather is, is, is very hot, and I think this is uh, the full body and the very fruity, uh, very fresh, uh, it's very nice. Yeah, I'm, I'm impressed with this. I think it's, I like the innovation. I love the packaging. I think it looks like a really smart, sophisticated high end wine. Um, Mark, what did you think of this wine? This one is very curious. Why? Two. Uh, uh, black uh, varieties for to do a white a white wine. I think it doesn't have uh, white varieties in his vineyard, maybe. <laughs> because so, yes, uh, I taste the the four wines uh, this Monday. And now this the same wine, the, so six uh, six days uh, open is really good. But for me, it's more a one in structure than in aromas. It's more in structure. You have tannins, you have salinity, and that is very good for food. Um, I think it's more uh, do for most done for food than for tooling in aperitif. Aperitif is good, but you have others wine in uh, Moldova for aperitif. That is very good for for food and uh, very spicy uh, food. Mm. I tried that uh, yesterday with uh, couscous. It, it was very good. Yes. And Judith, did you have your hand up earlier? Yes, yes. Because, because modern cuisine in Belgium don't exist. It doesn't exist. <laughs> Julia, did you raise your hand earlier? I just noticed. Yes, yes. So two things. Well, I, I think the branding is very interesting because I know that uh, uh, Dan Prisicaro also makes other um, uh, fairy tale characters, uh, names of, uh, of the cuvee. In uh, Harapal, it's an initiatic story. It's like the magical flute of um, 
Romanian speaking space and uh, uh, it's about a prince that really uh, transforms himself through an initiation and I think we are initiated by this wine because um, we expect something more phenolic but actually the wine it's it's surprising it doesn't get that green side of red made into uh, blonde de noir because sometimes we have to to pick them earlier so you don't have any pyrazine, any, um, any greenish style of the Cabernet Sauvignon that sometimes when it's made into Blanc de Noir could get into a kind of Sauvignonish style. And um, then you have the Fetasca background that brings a lot of fruitiness and you don't catch the phenolics. You just catch the fruits and you don't catch the phenolics. All that um, density, that vibrancy, that energy that comes on the finish, I think is due to the batonnage and the lazy character. And it's definitely, as Mark said, something for gastronomy, for pairing, for eating with. And uh, yeah, I most appreciated this um, Blanc de Noir, uh, more than other Blanc de Noir I tasted, either in Moldova or in other countries in Eastern European space. Robert, I believe you know the producer, yeah? Um, yes, I, uh, yeah, I do. Well, and many doing innovative things like this, you know? This... Yeah, I think that's one of the things that you're now seeing is this group of, and there is a group of young producers, and they're kind of like garagistes, if you would, in the old yeah. expression in France, if you like very small. Some of them are operating in, in literally industrial uh, uh, parks and one of them, for example, has got a uh, winery with graffiti all over it. Um, and also there's people making wine for each other or hosting, uh, looking after each other's barrels. It's very dynamic and I think one of the things I'd say quickly is if you go to Kishnar, it's got a wine bar culture which is growing quite quickly. And if you go there, get straight off the plane into the city and you can go into a wine bar and taste a number of these. Somebody, Jeff Burrows, has just mentioned the Atu winery is one of these wineries where you get uh, this kind of almost punk, but, but in a good way, uh, wineries. But it, this is something that's changing literally from year to year. The last five years, I'd say, you've mm -hmm. seen an explosion of these producers. And if we were in a normal day in Moldova, the National Wine Week, you would be tasting these live with these producers and that would be a very exciting thing to be doing. Yeah, I think that's that's always a, a really exciting dynamic and it's really good for a, a country when you've got people doing small scale projects with, you know, that are driven, they're vocation driven um, mm. uh, more than anything else. And we've seen that in South Africa very clearly with a lot of the, the winemakers doing a bit of homebrew on the side and um, you know, and, and that in, in that contributes something very, very um, exciting to the wine culture. And just one word, labeling. There's, there's a very, you can see on this, this, this bottle is a little, there's very sophisticated labeling happening in Moldova. Where is the wine, the winery? In Kishnau. In Kishnau, it is in uh, Kishnau, yes. And for, for me, the, the little wine vineyard is more interesting than the, the, than the larger ones. The dollar one, so. For, for me, because it's, the wines are more character than the good group like Porcari. Porcari is very good, right? It's well done for the international market, but for the little international markets, I think it's better for the little cabbies to have uh, so wines more original with more character, is with more identity of Moldova. Uh, Michelle, I realise that we haven't got you in the conversation yet, so um, it's, it's about time that I ask you a question. And really, I'd just love to know what is it excites you about Moldovan wine? And also, obviously, the US. What's the US like as a market for Moldovan wine? Is there lots of potential there? Um, I actually, I agree very much with what Mark and Robert have said. I think that the... Uh, the dynamics of the small producers are very interesting. I know that um, they have a small winery association, correct? That would be a great way to market those wines and be able to, um, to import them maybe as a collective unit to the US. Because at this point, I don't think most, Euro uh, most Americans know that Moldova, uh, where it is, that they make wine, um, there's, there, it hasn't penetrated the U.S. market. In 2018, there was only 2.5 percent of the, of the bottled wine was exported to the U.S. And um, I, I don't know how far the reach of it is. I have a, a friend who's actually watching today. Um, his name's Jim, and he has a, a wine blog, and he lives in New York City, 
which in uh, in the United States, you know, is the is the best place to get w wines from everywhere. And he looked high and low this week to try to find a wine from Moldova and was not able to find one. So, um, you know, there's there's a, there's a lag there, but yet, you know, to your question, Jamie, is is the U.S. available to Moldova? Absolutely. Um, they're marketing uh, a lot of you know money and time and marketing to educating the industry and then going on from there to the consumers. But um, in picking up from the conversation about grapes, um, I'm not sure that the United States necessarily needs another place to source uh, Cabernet wine from. So focusing on the um, indigenous varieties is, is very important and the blends. I think the blends are interesting because a lot of the indigenous grapes, you know, they're unusual names to the American dialect. And so if we have um, a blend, then it's, you know, a grape they're familiar with, perhaps with a new identity grape, and then you put those together and kind of meet people where they are and then move them solely into the indigenous varieties. But um, yeah, I think that there's a lot of, of dynamics. I think the labeling, what everyone has said, would be very appealing to Americans. We're, we're ready, bring it on. <laughs> Do you think that um, Moldova should be focusing it's it's proposition as being value for money these are good value for money wines or do you think moldova should be and this is a question to all of you generally in your different markets or should the focus be on these are high quality boutique wines and which which should be is is it you know because it's you've seen countries go in as the value for money proposition and then it's almost like the brands obscure the fact that they're from that country it's just going in as an inexpensive wine and it's tricky i think Oh, I'm sorry. It's it's sorry. tricky because there's, you know, Chile has done that and then they had to kind of backtrack and demonstrate that, yes, they're value for money, but they're also very quality wines. You know, there's a lot of value for money wines in the U.S. Um, that come uh, Portugal, all the different wine regions and different places in Latin America, some in Australia. So I think that, um, um, yes, I tasted the wines last night and the Percari, uh, the 2016, uh, Negru de Percari, that wine is fantastic. I was blown away by how modern it is in some respect, but yet it still kind of has that old world rustic nature that kind of pulls, you know, it's a nice tension. It's really appealing. And when I looked up the price, I couldn't believe how inexpensive it was. So yes, it is value for money, but I'm not sure that that's the right positioning. I think the positioning is more that they're unique and, you know, really food friendly. Americans love food friendly wine because we, you know, eat from all over the world. So, I mean, that's just my perspective. What, what do the rest of you think? Yeah, Jacques? Yes, you know, I can say a few words about the situation in Canada, you know? and the place of the ones from Moldova in Canada, and especially in Quebec. You know, in Canada, it's a big country, and there are monopoly everywhere, almost everywhere, everywhere. And in Quebec, we have a big monopoly. You know, it's a big province, but only 8 million and a half people. And we have around 10,000 different wines on the SAQ, SAQ, Société des Alcools du Québec. And we have a great choice. Uh, everywhere, you know, in the province, we have uh, around 400 uh, stores where you can find, so not everywhere, but those wines. So around uh, 10,000 wines, except uh, uh, private importation, okay? And the wines from Moldova arrived in Quebec uh, only uh, two years, three years ago. But we have on, on that time, uh, six, only six different wines. And I repeat again, except private importation, maybe you can find 20, 25 wines uh, in a private importation. But on the liquor store, you can find actually six wines from uh, three white, three reds. And the problem for me, I think they should increase the choice with a higher quality level because they have this quality level in Moldova. That's, that's true. Of course, everybody here knows that. We taste beautiful wines. And I think, you know, you find wines around uh, in, a, in a US dollars, around six, uh, seven, eight dollars a bottle. 
And they could increase the level, the quality level, because the people in Quebec are ready to discover and to love, to like those wines. Because they, they, we find good wines, but we have to increase the level, I think. Right. Um, so you understand? you understand with my English? Yes. Yes, perfect. Yes, okay. perfect. Um, Chantal, um, um, yeah. Moldova has been exporting wine to China for quite a long time now. Um, what sort of presence does Moldovan wine have in China? Um, my answer will be very disappointing for you because uh, personally, I never seen the Moldova wine in China, either in Taiwan or in Hong Kong. Maybe the quantity is so small. And I asked some of my uh, friends who, who, who are the wine lover, they never heard about this wine. So I don't know uh, the, the Moldova wine uh, in which distribution is in the, in the private club or in the restaurant or in the market. I, I'm sorry, I never, I never seen the people who drink uh, this wine already. So I'm sorry for that. Um, so let's move on to the second wine. I think that would be a good point. And a second wine, um, Mihail, could you tell us about this? Yes. It's Individo. It's a um, producer Mo. It's a Fetiasca Niagara, local grape variety. Uh, it's coming, so uh, we're speaking about free winemaking uh, zone. It's coming from uh, Val Lutrean zone. Uh, it's... Uh, interesting abordation of the winemaking person. It's calling Arkady Foshna who I'm making. Uh, here beginning the first uh, on, let's say, recent uh, period to make uh, the wines from local grape variety. And the Fityas Kanyagri is a very nice example. It's uh, um, oak, 12 uh, months it's uh, maturated in uh, oak. And uh, us usually it's a French oak. So, uh, Fetiasca Niagre usually have uh, uh, aromas of uh, red fruits. It's uh, cherry and very nice vanilla aroma. In the taste, it's lighter, but it's a very nice body with very great tannins mm -hmm. and uh, uh, it's let's say it's a gastronomical wine because it's pairing very well with some food. Usually we are making some food uh, pairing with this kind of wine. It's local uh, and traditional uh, Moldavian and Romanian food. Uh, it's some polenta with a very nice text, uh, soft texture of um, some meat. So it's need to be very well cooked. And it's cooking, we are telling it Freptura. It's a very, very nice uh, meat, which cooked a little bit more, and it's very soft meat. So the texture of the wine and with the food, it pairs very well. Um, so, um, Frank, what do you think of this wine? Have you got it there? Yeah. I... I must say I, I like that wine. It's got um, it's got a lot of fruits. It's got a lot of freshness, so um, it's it's uh, not heavy at all. It's got uh, quite smooth yet still to some extent grippy tannins. Um, personally, I think it's a, I think the the oak is a, it's not oaky. But the oak is rather heavily toasted, maybe. There's a bit of that sort of charred wood impression in the wine, um, which I suppose comes from oak. And um, th that, for my taste, could be a little bit uh, uh, less heavy-handed. But, uh, but again, but, but on the other hand, it's, it's a wine that, that drinks easily and, and that yet, at the same time, has character. So, no, it's a really good wine. Yeah. Yeah. Um Julia, what do you think of this one? Can 
Yes, I, I, um, I've been tasting this wine uh, over the years, the first time, and uh, it was precisely the same vintage, was in 2016, and uh, uh, in, seven, sorry, in um, what did I say, no, in uh, 2018. Uh, and uh, then last year, I tasted another vintage uh, at their place while eating um, a kind of frittura but revisited way with a little bit of um, grilled capsicum and um, stuffed with, um, uh, with a very soft, meaty stuffing. So it really was a very smooth pairing. And I agree with Mihail, we need to have something either traditional or revisited in this um, in this sense. Um, what I think nowadays uh, um, today about this wine, I like it because it's not extracted, it's not, um, uh, it's full-bodied without being full-bodied. It's full-bodied by the alcohol content because it's 14 and because you have texture, there are some residual sugar about 3.4 grams uh, like we usually find in a lot of wines in Moldova. So it gives this smooth attack, this texture, this envelope, but um, it has um, tannins, uh, without being very elevated, very high, they just feel a little bit grippy, a little bit firm, a little bit refirmed by the oak use as well, but it's not extracted. So you still get that um, uh, drinkability and digestibility. Um, and also there is a hint of tertiary now in this um, in this wine, but you still have fruit. You have this cooked fruit, this uh, red and black fruit, and a little bit of capsicum, uh, some spices, and some toastiness, smokiness coming from uh, the wood, uh, which I, I, I think it's interesting. It's logically blended with the fruit. The fruit. And as I said, if you put something a little bit uh, grilled, a little bit toasted like that um, capsicum, that red capsicum, um, which was candied and uh, grilled, it really gives you that smokiness you find in the wine. Um, I think it's a, an interesting wine. Uh, their range individual is uh, remarkable for the drinkability. This is my opinion. We've had a question through. Um... Um, about the, could somebody give a brief overview of Moldova's appellations? So, Mihail, yes. uh, are appellations important? I know there's the three PGIs. Yes. Uh, is it important or are they? Yeah. It's, it's, very, it's very important. And uh, so, let's say the, it was a challenge to establish the European approved protection, like geographical indication zone. Inclusive now, it's uh, indicated on the label, this PGI zone. So uh, we are speaking about three uh, zones. It's Kodru, Stefan Vode, and Valui Trajan. So it's free. Uh, this uh, wine which you are tasting is from Valui Trajan, so it's the south. Uh, and uh, it's a very hot climate. It's a very particular climate there uh, let's say so it's around 2800 hours of sun so it's a lot of sun there and it's a specific zone for um, red wines also Stefan Wode we know the famous uh, let's say Purkari zone we're going to taste uh, this wine and it's also very well known with the influence of uh, Black Sea and uh, also some particular soil uh, properties. And of course, Kodru is the biggest uh, zone, uh, which is specific for uh, white wines and also rosé and red wines uh, production. Great, thank you for that. Um, let's move on um, to the third of the four wines, um, which is the very attractively packaged Negre. Negre from Fato. So Mihail, tell us about this wine. The wine which have the more quantity of the medals. It's a very award international wine. It's 100% uh, of uh, local grape varieties. Fetiaska Niagara and Rara Niagara. Such kind of wine you can find just in Moldova, of course. And um, it's a very interesting blend. It's a producer who uh, also coming from Valley Trajan, soft, uh, soft uh, winemaking zone. Uh, the wine which have a lot of international 
the one which have a lot of international awards and uh, it's like this kind of wine is like a fine wine fine wines it's selling very well in the restaurants in the specialized shops and have a very good uh, um, a very good reputation and a lot of people who are buying this wine who are trying this kind of wine it's coming from the Negri. It's the, uh, it's uh, not the second. I, I thought it's uh, it's several edition of this, and uh, always it's limited edition. It's also twelve months maturation in French oak, and uh, it's nice, smooth, very uh, very well uh, balanced. And uh, we, we are speaking early about this, like a uh, oaky style of the wines. Uh, it's like a traditional because in our cuisine, it's also people are using a lot of salty, a lot of spicy. So mm -hmm. this is like a traditional taste, not uh, something. Uh, we like this kind of wine, which is um, maturated in oak. And uh, this is, let's say, a little bit style of uh, winemaker. Of course, it is wines. It's also where it's not oak, but let's say this is uh, their perspective and their view about this kind of wine. Andre, what do you think of this wine? How do you experience this? This is actually one of the Bordeaux wines that I've tasted several times. And, and this was one of my favorites uh, uh, during my trip last year. Uh, I think it's, um, I don't know much about vintages in Moldova, but I think 2017 might be a little hotter, a little, the fruit might be a, be a little warmer than I remember it. But of course we are in the southern part of, of the country, speaking of regions uh, again, and you can feel that. But of course it's, it's very interesting because you have the two local varieties uh, here. And, and even if the fruit is very mature, you have this, very tannic backbone, especially in, in the finish. The, the taste, it tastes, it finishes dry and really tannic uh, without getting too much. I, I, I really like it, but I would probably wait one more year, maybe two years, and definitely have it, have it uh, with, with uh, a steak or something uh, with a lot of proteins um, uh, in it. It's good, it's very good. Mark, what do you think about this wine? I agree with uh, André. Uh, I was with him last year in Moldova in August, and it was one of the first red wine we returned there. And another time, the, um, we were there uh, Monday and Tuesday, the same wine uh, with a big degustation. And for me, it is one of the best wine, um, and right. also for. The, the South Country with very hot country, with very ripe uh, fruit, but with very good structure, with the tannins and with the acidity. And for me, the acidity is with um, acid and salt. And the two give, uh, for me, a very good balance with the fruit and also um, a little bit of uh, rose, old rose, with um, floral uh, perfume. And yeah, it's, for me, it's a very, very good wine, very good example for, um, from the local varieties. And with more character than the president, for me, the president is a little bit too refinated. This one is of more, more character. I prefer that. Hey, so moving on to the fourth of the wines, Michelle mentioned this earlier. She's got, I believe, the 2016 version. I think most of us have got 2018. Um, Really impressive packaging. Um, Mihail, tell us about this famous yes. wine. So it's a wine which it is historical wine. It's, uh, we have a legend that uh, this wine obtains a lot of uh, medals and have a very rich history. The wine which uh, uh, won the big gold medal in the Bordeaux contest in 1820. Seven, so it's the year of establish of the winery. So it's it's a, it's a pure philosophy of uh, the, behind the this wine. Mm -hmm. uh, we have three grapes: Cabernet Sauvignon, 
Sapiravi and Rara Niagara. Sapiravi, it's a Georgian grape, but very well integrated in the winemaking uh, zone of Moldova. And uh, uh, it's 18 months oak uh, wine. So 18 months, it's uh, in also classic uh, French uh, barracks. Uh, and uh, the wine have also very good potential for aging. So this kind of wine, uh, we have some specific years, which is, um, uh, it's very particular and people <coughs> are searching this kind of wine this year. So for example, for 2016, people are searching this kind of wine. This kind of wine are putting in the private collection and people are enjoying during the years. Uh, it's also different, uh, different winemaking zone, it's Stefan Wode zone. And this is a perfect example of an international style of wine. So wine competition, a lot of medals, a new approach of uh, wine varieties. So we can tell that it's uh, local varieties because we have Rara Niagara and we have a modern style of winemaking. And it's also uh, respecting PGI norms. So Stefan Vode region. This which need uh, Moldavian wine to be well known and to be international, uh, to, to be in international wine scene. Yeah, I quite, what I like about this wine is that it's certainly, yeah, it is international in the sense that it's, it's a, uh, it's an accessible style and there's love, lovely fruit presence and there's a bit of oak, but um, also it does have some sort of personality that, that, that sets it apart a little bit. It does taste a little bit different and I quite appreciate that. And I wonder whether the Saparavi component might be adding something to that because it's such an interesting grape variety. I mean, Michelle, what's your impression of this wine? I think you quite liked it, didn't you? I liked it quite a bit. Yes. Yes. And my, um, uh, after I wrote my tasting notes, when I when I tasted it yesterday evening, I I said, you know, this is the wine. As a Texan, I'm I'm American, but I'm also a Texan. So this is the steak wine with the uh, peppercorn sauce and blue cheese with some sweet potatoes and roasted Brussels sprouts or something like. That's what this this wine can stand up to um, some California wines. It's that's why I'm saying the tension of it. it it's it's very modern and elegant and polished, and yet there's still kind of that that old world rusticness that that pulls you back. It it really just balances out both very well for me. And um, Jacques, do you do you have this wine? Yeah. Uh, yeah, you know, it's very very interesting to talk about this wine. You know, because uh, for me, uh, I had the chance to to taste uh, the 2016 uh, last year uh, when I was visiting uh, Pourcari. And uh, yesterday, as, uh, like Michel, I opened my bottle and uh, we have to say first that we have a little bit less uh, Saperavi in the 2016. I think it's 25% of Saperavi and 70% of Cabernet Sauvignon. But I agree with Michel, it's a beautiful wine because with a touch of Rara Niagara, maybe they could put a little bit more of Rara Niagara in the next, uh, next vintage maybe. But we have beautiful uh, nose of uh, blackberries, a touch of chocolate. And uh, I think this wine is much better this year, better than last year, 2016. Mm -hmm. But it's a good finesse, good structure, and very well balanced about the acidity. And uh, I found a touch, still a touch of graphite. We say graphite, mm -hmm. I think. Huh? Mm -hmm. uh, but last year, last year, the same vin uh, vintage, it, it was a little bit more graphite. And now we find the grapes, beautiful tannins, uh, very uh, simple. But I think this one is still young. It's still mm -hmm. young. It should be better in three or four years more. But yesterday night, I, I drink it uh, a glass with a beautiful fillet of beef. Mm -hmm. and, uh, only like that. Uh, and it was wonderful. <laughs> yeah. uh, yes, I, I've been experimenting um, 
um, some vintages over this past year because I had the chance to taste a 2011, which is a vintage release, the 2013, the 2015, which is also a vintage release, and this 2018. And I was checking my tasting notes, and indeed, the proportion of Saperave uh, was a little bit less on this other vintages than on the 18, whereas 40% and on the others was um, uh, on the 25 range. And I think the Cabernet marked those other vintages, giving um, also this uh, graphite, as Jacques said, and this backbone of acidity, of tannins. And here with the Supper of, I think they use um, a, a peculiar clone, which is not, um, or an adaptation to the Moldovan um, terrar and climate, which has not that rustic grip as, uh, as the Supper of we can meet in, uh, in Georgia. And it brings, on the contrary, something juicier and more finesse than the vintages that are really focused on, on, on big backbone, like 70% of, um, of Cabernet Sauvignon. But um, uh, anyway, what I, I experimented through this small vertical that I tasted in different moments, of course, uh, uh, since October, um, uh, last October when I was in Moldova and nowadays when we are virtual in Moldova, is that all these wines have um, a gorgeous potential for aging. I've always been writing between eight and ten and even more than a decade for the, for the vintage releases. And also they are very digest. They have this acidity um, that sometimes it's more balanced by the residual sugar or the alcohol in other brands like photo or for instance, where alcohol is a bit more generous, where there's a, um, let's say a smoother attack. But here you, even if you have three grams of sugar, you don't feel them as a smooth attack. You just perceive this digestibility, this freshness, the tiny grip, which is very refined, always fine grained. And the oak maturing is particularly well integrated, even if we have 18 months and the wine is really, really young. This, uh, uh, this 2018, we are tasting most of us. And I think it can really shoot, um, as Michelle said, something, um, let's say a more Texan style, but also uh, pigeon, uh, squab, even, uh, even um, uh, duck breast in a very fine dining style with cherries, with Morello cherries, something like licorice or um, a very fine spice like cinnamon, a uh, very smooth puree like sweet potatoes. So I think it, it really fits in a fine dining contest as well. Okay. Robert. Um, just very briefly, so I know we're near the end. I'd just like to make one point that I think the quality of winemaking, um, you know, we can talk about the grapes, we can talk about the regions. I think Moldova, and I think people here have visited Moldova, I think there is some very, very sophisticated winemaking going on there. You can see that in the Pokhari wines, not this just one, but in a number of their wines. Um, but I think across these four bottles, um, you can see that there's some very good thinking going on um, at the level of the winemaking. There's work to be done in the vineyards. There's a lot of work to be done. There's, I think there's huge scope for improvement in Moldova. I think the Moldovans themselves would admit that. But I think that what we have seen is being at the, the equipment in the winery, as you've heard, has, is already very much state of the art. And I think that as each year goes on, I'm seeing that quality of winemaking being applied more and more successfully to more and more interesting grapes that are coming in. So I think Moldova is definitely work in progress at already a very high level. And I think this, the, the Pukari is a very good example of the sort of the flagship of the country. Inevitably, it's the one that's the longest history, but I think it's showing a lot of other wineries where, what they could do. And maybe uh, to, to, to Mark's point, there'll be ones that are maybe more uh, more characterful or less international, you might say, that will please the carve east more. But as Michelle said, this, if you want to be in a restaurant in Texas or New York, you put this on a table, and I think somebody's going to be very, very happy to buy it. Thank you. That's really good. And I think that's a really good point for us to draw our proceedings to a close. We've, we've done an hour. It's gone very quickly. Um, I just want to thank all of you for your contributions. Um, and I've certainly just really enjoyed talking, discussing and tasting these wines, which I think, uh, you know, are four very interesting um, place markers for different directions that the wine 
scene is taking in Moldova. And I, I've tried a couple of others recently. I tried a very impressive Chardonnay and, and a remarkable sparkling wine from Pukari, which was like um, very, very high quality. And I was, I was just taken aback by it. So, so yeah. So um, yeah, on that note, I'd like to um, raise a glass to toast National Wine Day. Cheers. Cheers. How do we say cheers? Cheers. 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 cheers to all. Narok. 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 Narok is great. Cheers to all of you. Thank you. Thank you to our panel and thank you to all of our attendees. Uh, just a reminder, a recording of today's webinar will be published to the Wine of Moldova's YouTube channel in the next couple of days. And all of you participants will receive an email with that link. So thank you again. Happy My Wine Day and wishing you all a safe and enjoyable weekend.